So Clive has finished his mission over at that marsh, that swamp, the abandoned town, and he's going to go head over to the Phoenix Gate to meet up with his father and his brother. Now, there's some sort of ritual they need to do here. I figured it was a kind of like an Oracle of Delphi kind of thing, where the dominant of Phoenix, which is Joshua, has to be present to perform some kind of a ritual, but we haven't really gotten any details over what's going on here. Suddenly, thousands of red eyes. No, wait till you hear this. Wait till you hear this. His lordship draws his sword. The goblin chief runs off screaming. Straight down a marvelous gun. More tales. Drink and be merry, boys. Gratifying to see your student making such a name for himself. <laughs> the young lord has a bright future ahead of him. Aye, and one of these nights he may even deign to join us. Father, just a little tired. Well, it has been a long day. They all like Clive, don't they? Hmm, aye. Your brother will be a fine shield. We're all very proud of him. Father? Why is it? Dominus is always born into our family. It doesn't seem fair. We cannot live without the blessing of the crystals. And the crystals work their magic through us. You have been blessed, Joshua. Blessed to be a dominant. To wield the power of an icon. Our family has been chosen to share that power with the people. So that is what we must do. Fine hound. So this is where you've been hiding. What are you doing out here? I didn't see you at the feast. Feasts are the only time shields are allowed to take their ease, and I've never really been one for cakes and ale. It's the vegetables I don't like.
I hear you slew a marble. All the men were singing your praises. They never used to. When I joined the ranks, everyone thought I was a spoiled little lordling. If I didn't know how to handle a sword, I'd be a laughing stock. The Archduke's firstborn failure. You're the one they really believe in. I'm jealous. That's not true. They don't believe in me. They believe in the power of the dominant. My brother the Phoenix, ruler over life and death. It isn't fair. It should have been you. I don't have what it takes to lead our people. I don't have the strength. But you do. Every man has his duty. Ours was decided long ago, when our ancestors chose to instate the dominant as the Archduke of Rosaria. All to ensure that whenever our nation stood on a precipice, the Phoenix would rise from the flames to drag us back from the brink. The fate of Rosaria sits on the dominant shoulders. It is your duty to bear that burden. What about you? I was born to be your shield. That is why I was given the Phoenix's blessing. To keep our future rulers safe. No matter what. However hard it gets. I'll never, punch I'll never let you down. Thank you, Clive. I know you'll always take care of me. Before I can do that, you need to take care of yourself. Right? I should go inside. It's past my bedtime. Good night, Torgal. from the capital. You took your time sampling the wearers, were you? <laughs> Good job the North is full of enterprising traders keen to keep us in wine. Spare a barrel for the boys on duty, eh? What in the... Gateway secured, Captain. We proceed as planned.
Forgive me, my prince. It's me, Wade. You probably don't remember me. I remember. What is it? We're under attack. I don't know who they are, but they've set light to half the castle. I must get you to safety, Your Highness. Very well. I'm ready. Something I didn't expect, we're actually playing as Joshua, and you see a pretty big difference in the way that these two characters work. Clive is primarily dependent on the use of his sword, his um, swordsmanship, his ability to dodge, all that kind of stuff. And he has some magical abilities, but they are nowhere near as strong as what Joshua has. Joshua, although he is carrying a sword, doesn't seem to ever use it. So, you have... Um, Clive, which is the more physically powerful of the two, and then you have Joshua, who is much weaker. I mean, not just because he's younger, but he's a sickly child. And, like, despite the fact that he is the stronger of the two with magic, the magic seems to take quite a bit out of him. Every time he casts one of these fire spells, which are tremendously powerful, by the way, he sort of wears himself out, and he coughs or whatever. See, okay, so I'm going to cast a spell on this thing, and you'll see what I mean. A powerful attack, but he wears himself out, and then he has to recover a little bit before he can attack again. So it's this kind of interesting dynamic that the two characters have. I would suspect that between the two, Joshua is the more powerful uh, one because he has the ability to transform into the phoenix. And as we've seen, all of the summon creatures are tremendously powerful. We saw phoenix in a sort of opening uh, cinematic battle fighting E3, and it's, it's really strong. So if that's the potential that he has, Joshua has, he could be really powerful indeed, but it doesn't really manifest that well. I wonder why it is that he has such power, but he is so physically compromised. And his, his potential really all that high if he can't really cast spells without it wearing him out. So we saw the... Well, we didn't really see the others. I mean, Clive is able to cast his magic without tiring himself at all. And the only other spellcasters we saw were those assassins at the beginning, which seemed to do it without any difficulty. And the Shiva and Titan that we saw in the early parts of the game were fighting each other. But that wasn't like humans casting spells. That was after they transformed into the summon creatures. What are the uh, icons they're called? It's kind of, they spell it kind of weird, so I keep getting that wrong. They transform into the icons. So they don't seem like they're wearing themselves out there. So maybe just Joshua's a sickly child, sort of like, um, what was that kid that was the the Russian czar's son that was sickly? Well, I don't know. Damn it! His wounds are deep. I can save him. Your Highness... going to be all right. I'll hold them off. Rescued the young prince. Well done, Sir Wade. 
I am in your debt, soldier. Thank you, Your Grace. We cannot stay here. We should make straight for the rear gate. May the winds speed you to Rosalith. The north gate's up ahead. There are chocobos in the stables. Father, take Joshua and get to safety. Shield, remember? I remember, which is why I'm going to hold the enemy here while you make your escape. I will order our remaining forces to rally at the gate. Now go. I will do my duty. You must do your duty too. Despite being the um, prince or whatever you call it, Joshua is actually a pretty kind-hearted person, and he's actually using his magic to help people. Now, he helped his brother when his brother was worn out after and injured after his training in the beginning of the demo, and he helps this soldier heal from his wounds, although using this magic costs Joshua quite a bit. It seems like something he's willing to do. Not just because this is somebody who would help him escape this situation and would help his family escape the situation, but I figure even if Joshua's life wasn't on the line here, he probably would have done that anyway. He seems to be someone who actually cares about the people under his rule, and he doesn't, um, doesn't really look down on the people around him. I guess that's something that him and Clive, in a sense, sort of share, because we ran across that that slave that, um, what were they called? Um, the ones with the tattoos on their face. Ran into one of those slaves in the previous episode, and he was sort of like reassuring, and he, was, he didn't look down on the guy at all. So I guess that's something that the two share, and maybe it's something i mean I, it's can't imagine everybody looks down at their uh everybody treats their slaves quite as well as these people do but they are still kind of enslaving these people so it's kind of it's kind of fucked up <laughs> can't go through that door hmm, let's try this one this i feel like is a little unnecessary i don't really want to have to push the r2 button for any of this stuff escape as you command you take care of that spellcaster i'll keep the others occupied not really a mini boss battle it's just a sort of 
um, another group of standard ass enemies that we're fighting here. Now I'm a little bit lost as to where these guys came from. I know they come from an empire somewhere. And it seems to be the empire that Clive is working for at the beginning of the game. So how he ends up there with the tattoo on his face. Sorry, I don't have the audio here. The audio's just going to be messed up for the next couple of episodes because I wasn't... I just screwed up the recording too bad. What are they talking about? Oh, okay. So, Clive, under a different name at the beginning of the demo, had one of these tattoos on his face and had, um, had one of these tattoos on his face and was enslaved by this empire that we're fighting, it seems. I wonder, does that mean that the tattoo itself actually has some sort of mind control over them? Because what would what would happen to make Clive not only be willing to work for the people who are attacking his kingdom, but like enslaving him and and not just like locking him in a dungeon and forcing him to do menial labor, but actually like giving him a sword and having him go do important missions and shit. So that that uh, that brand brand they're called branded, aren't no. Branded. Yeah, yeah, they're called Branded. That's, um... There must be some kind of... Um... There must be some kind of mind control element when it comes to the brand, because how else would Clive be so um, accepting of his fate and not try to rebel in some way? This is a kind of a boss battle here. You have this large, um, have this large health bar that appears in the corner of the screen, and these enemies take a hell of a lot more damage. They don't really feel too much like damage sponges, but they do definitely take a lot more hits than most enemies. And you have to really get a good idea of how to balance your attacks and your dodging and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, uh, for the first few episodes of this series, I have the easy mode um, trinkets equipped on my character, so basically all the difficulty is just sucked out of this game until I realize what I had done wrong and change it. I've played all the way through the demo, and some length into the actual game, so... I do, re I do know that I eventually realized my mistake, but I, I can't quite say exactly in what episode it is I'm going to fix it. You know, this kind of windscreen here sort of kills the cinematics, cinematic factor of what you're watching. It should just go straight into this. I'm fine. So, they sent in the dragoons, Imperial Vipers. Do they really mean to invade us? Not yet. Their numbers were too few. They were not here to take the castle. They were here to take heads. Our work is done. We should return to my father. My lord, look. We issued these sashes but yesterday. In Rosalith. If they were already among us, what if there were others? Father and Josh, you are in danger. We must hurry. Take your steed. What is that? Goodness. The 
Your Grace, is everyone safe? For the moment. We ride for Roslip to rally our forces. I will need your help to see Joshua safely back to the capital. On you get Joshua. Father? I'm sorry, Your Grace, but that won't be possible. Snakes! Stay back! I'm warning you! Run, Joshua! Run! No! Pig! Control! I have to do something! I have to save him! No, my lord! Fall back! <laughs> Clive! Joshua, are you in pain? Ah! Uh, not now. Come on! You're his shield. Do your duty. Save him. My lord?
So we see a display of Joshua's true power, the ability to turn into the phoenix. And despite being a sickly child, he is a tremendously powerful individual, but he is fighting another icon of fire here. Now, they seem to imply that there's not many of these dominants out in the world. So the discovery that another person might potentially be a dominant that nobody suspected is kind of like a, a big deal. Saw in the beginning during that kind of negotiation that each country, each kingdom, each empire, whatever, is referring to their dominant uh, in uh, singular. And that implies that there simply aren't many of them. And any one that a kingdom or country or whatever may have is so tremendously valuable that it's maybe not even worth it to field them in a battle. So there's not many of these. And to have two of them, especially being part of the same family, seems exceptionally rare. So we're having Phoenix fight Ifrit here. And I think it's pretty clear that we're looking at Clive is Ifrit. Although um, it was mentioned that as Phoenix, Joshua didn't have control over himself here. So I imagine Clive isn't really acting out of rage or anything. He just doesn't have control over Ifrit. Both of these summon creatures being reoccurring summonings in the earlier Final Fantasy games, especially Ifrit, who seems to be in most every one of the games, except for like 12. They didn't have any in 12, did they? Of the normal ones, anyway. It's a very one-sided battle you have going on here, because all you have to do is dodge <laughs> and just keep firing off these attacks. Somehow he's able to keep up with you. <laughs> now, I wonder how this worked out, though, because... There clearly must have been some sort of procedure that they go through in order to discover who is or who isn't a dominant. It's not just they when somebody transforms into one is when you realize it, because I mean they would have they know they knew Joshua was a dominant prior to his transformation. So how were they not able to tell that Clive is a dominant as well? That's that's a question I'd like answered. <laughs> Must be some kind of conspiracy with this. An interesting thing to note, though, is Clive's mother seems to despise him as being weak and useless. I wonder if she would have a different opinion about him if she were aware that he had this similar kind of power, too. You know, I guess them being brothers and, like, being part of the same family and the same genetics and all that might be the reason why they both have fire icons that they transform into, although they're different they're different um, monsters. You know, I also figure that uh, is the you know, I don't know, is the icon a separate entity from the dominant? Like is um is Joshua and Phoenix separate entities? Does Joshua just transform into Phoenix? Or does Phoenix just kind of use Joshua as a sort of a host, as a sort of a vessel to transform into this? And they're separate personalities or separate individuals. That seems to be the case, though, because Joshua seems to have a measure of control over the Phoenix here, although he didn't earlier. But um, Clive seems to have no control over what he's doing here, which kind of imply that it's a separate entity that... Plus, he saw something. He saw that, that man cloaked in fire. And that has to be the sort of spirit of, of Ifrit there. So Clive is just some kind of a... just some kind of a vessel for the spirit of Ifrit. And Joshua would be the same thing for be the same thing for Phoenix. And I guess the same thing would apply for Titan and Shiva that we saw in the beginning of the game. So I guess that would mean if you if they were going to hunt down Shiva in the beginning and they were going to assassinate her, you're basically even though she's a combatant and warrior assassinating an innocent person. That's kind of fucked up. <laughs> but you know, everything's fucked up.
Got him. <laughs>